Oh, hi, come in. <coughs> I'm just about to stagger over to the window because I've put away this recent biography of Ted Hughes, The Unauthorised Life, <laughs> uh, Jonathan Bate. It's a very fine writer. Bate, Bate writes incredibly well about what's called sort of um, eco-criticism or, you know, e eco-poetry. And, of course, Ted Hughes is a great niche, but... I'm starting to run out of spaces no, massively. We'll put this. That's Ted Hughes's letters. But anyway, I was thinking about Hughes because uh, my college, Pembroke uh, College in Cambridge, have a seat. My college, I got you this chaos here. I'm trying to work on two different books at the moment. One's due at the end of this month, and the other's due at the end of April. So I've got all these piles of paper. So I probably shouldn't be stopping to uh, indulge myself in extra poetry reading but there it is yeah anyway my college Pembroke um, were in touch with me recently um, because there's an anniversary coming up of Ted Hughes's strange compelling disturbing powerful poetry sequence uh, Crow and they wanted me to do a, a thing about it which I did um, but it set me thinking about Hughes Hughes went to Pembroke uh, in the 50s uh, and I went in the 70s um, but, you know, even in the, seven, in the 70s, the memory of his having been there was still pretty strong. Um, I started reading Ted Hughes's poetry in the early 70s, um, when I was a teenager. Um, I found his books on the library shelf in my school, um, and I was really found his poetry compelling because it was a sort of um, wonderfully close to nature without being sentimental about it and yet um, using natural images in a way that affected how you could think about life and about yourself. It kind of gave you new pictures to think with really. Anyway, one of the things that uh, kind of emerges is that Hughes was he was brought up, you know, in Yorkshire and went, did a lot of fishing and foraging and little bits of hunting and things. He's always very much a kind of practical country man and fishing was the great thing. Anyway, I thought it might be fun. I was reading, the, the, one of the first poems of his I ever read was a poem called Pike, which in some ways is just like a fisherman's story. I mean, it's like you tell the story about the one that got away or you tell the story about the ones that you think are in there and fishermen going on like that but it, it's a very very powerful poem um, partly because of the way it makes things about scale and gets you to reimagine scale and then there's a much later poem that he wrote about a kind of moment of almost epiphany uh, fishing for salmon and um, one of the poems is dark and the other is light I hope we've got time for them I, I might not be able to read the whole of Pike but um, pike Pike Three inches long Perfect pike in all parts Green tigering the gold Killers from the egg The malevolent aged grin They dance on the surface among the flies Or move stunned by their own grandeur Over a bed of emerald Silhouette of submarine delicacy and horror a hundred feet long in their world. In ponds, under the heat-struck lily pads, gloom of their stillness, logged on last year's black leaves, watching upwards, or hung in an amber cavern of weeds, the jaws hooked clamp and fangs, not to be changed at this date, a life subdued to its instrument, the gills kneading quietly, and the pectorals. Three. We kept behind glass, jungled in weed, three inches, four, and four and a half. We fed fry to them. Suddenly there were two, finally one, with a sag belly and the grin it was born with. And indeed they spare nobody. Two, six pounds each, over two feet long, high and dry and dead in the willow herb, one jammed past its gills down the other's gullet. The outside eye stared as a vice locks and the same iron in this eye, though its film shrank in death. 
A pond I fished, fifty yards across, whose lilies and muscular tench had outlasted every visible stone of the monastery that planted them, stills legendary depth. It was as deep as England. It held pike too immense to stir, so immense and old that past nightfall I dared not cast, but silently cast and fished with the hair frozen on my head. For what might move, for what I might move, the still splashes on the dark pond. Owls hushing the floating woods, frail on my ear, against the dream darkness beneath night's darkness had freed, that rose slowly towards me, watching. Amazing ending to that poem. That's astonishing. Um, like I said, the shifts in perspective. You start with this little pike, but he's got a little baby pike, you know, pike three inches long, perfect pike, you know. And then he suddenly says, imagine you're a tiny little fish among the fish. A pike for you is like a hundred feet long, a hundred feet long in its world. And then he comes in and out. And at the last, you end up with this actual pond, the old monastic fish pond that he's fishing at night and he's frightened. But there's as it were a pond within the pond or beneath the pond, the sense of something stirring in the depth, owls hushing the floating woods frail on my ear against the dream darkness. Darkness beneath night's darkness had freed. So there's a kind of other darkness, an inner darkness, and it's almost as though it's a kind of fish of the soul. It's something dark coming up. And as a younger man, Ted is fairly obsessed with that. And of course he lived through terrible tragedy as we know but I don't want to leave you there with the kind of scary pike because later on there's an amazing poem in his sequence called River that came in out in the 80s and um, it's just a poem called That Morning and it's about yeah, like that perfect one is fishing and he was out he was actually although there's allusions to the Calder Valley and the, the rivers he was brought up with in Yorkshire as a kid the actual setting for this moment in this poem is a river in Alaska and Hughes has grown up and his grown up son Nick Nicholas he, uh, he and his son are fishing together. Let me let me read it to you. It's just called That Morning. It's one of my favourite uh, Ted Hughes poems. It's kind of moment of complete mystical awareness. That Morning. We came where the salmon were so many, so steady, so spaced, so far aimed on their inner map. England could add only the sooty twilight of South Yorkshire, hung with the drumming drift of Lancasters, till the world had seemed capsizing slowly. Solemn to stand there in the pollen light, waist deep in wild salmon, swaying mast as from the hand of God. There the body separated, golden and imperishable from its doubting thought, a spirit beacon lit by the power of the salmon that came on, came on, and kept on coming, as if we flew slowly, their formations drifting, lifting us towards some dazzle of blessing one wrong thought might darken. As if the fallen world and salmon were over, as if these were the imperishable fish that had let the world pass by. There in a mauve light of drifted lupins, they hung in the cupped hands of the mountains made of tingling atoms. It had happened. Then, for a sign that we were where we were, two gold bears came down and swam like men beside us and dived like children and stood in deep water as on a throne eating pierced salmon off their talons. So we found the end of our journey. So we stood alive in the river of light among the creatures of light, creatures of light. Oh, that wonderful rhyme of light with light. It's kind of like the moment at the end of a pilgrimage. We came to where the sun were, and so we came, and so, and, and the, the moment where suddenly the river is full of this great school of salmon swimming past, and he's lifted out 
lifted us towards some dazzle of blessing one wrong thought might darken like don't let me turn my mind from this suddenly the world is illuminated and i love the thing about the the the, the river there and everything is 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 hung in the cupped hands of the mountains made of tingling atoms and then extraordinarily these bears come down to enjoy the salmon and for a moment he feels this unity i just i think you can see it the way this is written at the end this line to itself, so we found the end of our journey. So we stood, alive in the river of light, among the creatures of light, creatures of light. You can say, you could just be repeating creatures of light in all, but it means among all these creatures of light, the salmon and the bears and the mountains, we too were creatures of light. We too were somehow made of light itself. It's a moment of, of complete transfiguration and for me uh, it has very strong spiritual and scriptural resonance that it's about being in a fallen world and suddenly being lifted out of the fall suddenly lifted out into things as they're seen in the eye uh, of God and that final image of a river of light is straight out of Dante as well Dante and Beatrice as they come closer to God he says I saw light in the form of a river and of course in the book of Revelation there's this wonderful image of the river Who's, with the trees beside it whose leaves are for the healing of nations and this is a river of, of, of light. So, um, though Hughes is very much more a nature poet than in any sense a religious poet, I think he's given us a great spiritual moment here. And uh, I love the way we can move in a sense from our apprehension of the darkness and terror of the many aspects of life that's there in Pike, but also of the astonishing moments of lift and revelation. Yeah, he's a very fine poet, so it's nice to, to dip back into Hughes every now and again. Thanks for dropping around.